Hi, I'm Sam Ben Yaakov. This presentation is entitled Flyback CCM and DCM Magnetics Compared and Why is DCM Sometimes Preferred? Please be aware that there are some relevant videos in my YouTube channel, which are shown here. I'm also going to print them at the page of this vi video that you are now watching, so you can click and get to these videos. I highly recommend to look at them because they are very relevant to this video. So what is a flyback converter? In flyback converter, we do have a coupled inductor, sometimes called transformer. It's not a transformer, it's a coupled inductor. A switcher, we turn on the switch and then energy is stored in the inductor. And then when the switch is off, energy is actually released to the output. So there are two ways of operating the flyback converter. One is the CCM, in which the energy never goes down to zero within the core, so that we always see current either as a primary or the secondary. Here we see the primary is charging, and then it's discharging through the secondary. In the case of the DCM, there is a charging and discharging, but there is also a period of no energy within the core. So the point that we are trying to find out is what is determining the magnetic size of the coupled inductor. That is the size of the element. Now please be aware that the core size is not determined only by the inductance. You may have a one micro Henry inductor, which is very big or very small, depending on the current and then on frequency and some other parameters which are relevant in the determining the size of the inductor. One way to approach the question of size is the so-called APA approach, the area product, which is the product of the cross-section area of the core times the winding window area. Here is the winding window area, it's an E core, two E cores clamped together. Here is the winding window area, and this is the cross-section of the core. So a parameter that is uh, very convenient for determining the size is this product, which has kind of a strange uh, dimension of, of uh, meter to the fourth, because it's a area times area, but this gives us a notion of the size of the element that we need for a given application. So what is determining the window winding area? Well, we assume that we like to utilize the core as much as possible, so therefore we're going to fill it up with wires, so not to waste any area. And that is that the area will be equal to the number of wires that we have here, number of wires, times the cross-section of each wire, and divided by k. k is the field factor, and that is to take into account that you cannot pack wires with no voids in between. There are spaces in between. So k is smaller than 1, and therefore the area is going to be filled by n, could be primary and secondary. This is just a summing of all the windings, divided by k. Now the cross-section area of the wire that you need depends on the current density that you decide on. It has to do with the heating up, resistance, and which is ampere meter square and therefore the cross-section area is the RMS current over J. So we come up with this equation which shows that the window area, winding window area, when filled up will be equal to N1, this is the primary, which is normalized to it, over JK, summation of all the windings, including the first one, and this is nice because we have here only the turn ratios, times the RMS, RMS of each winding. So this determines the winding window area. Now what determines the cross-section area of the core? This is primarily has to do with the actual BH curve, the hysteresis curve. I'm not showing the hysteresis here, but this is a non-linear curve. And there are two points here. One is that we don't want to 
exceed a maximum value so as not to go into saturation. And then there is another aspect, which today is more important, and that is we don't want to have more than a given delta B, not larger than a given value. The reason is that the core loss is a function of this delta B through the Steinmetz equation. And here it's showing the way usually you get it at the data sheet. This is delta B over two, delta B over two, and I'm approximating a, actually a triangular way by a sinusoidal way and also this measure this actually has been measured around zero so it's all an approximation which unfortunately we have to live with and this curve shows that the loss per volume of the core is a function of this excursion this this delta b and frequency so if you're working at a given frequency and you don't want to exceed a given loss per volume then this is the maximum delta b you allow i'm doing this analysis here this presentation under the assumption that this is the limiting factor which in fact is today because we are working at high frequencies if you work at low frequency then the saturation limitation is probably more important Again, in the videos that I've linked, there are some discussion on this issue too. So what is determining now the cross-section area? We start with the state space equation of the inductor, and then we have Vn dF dt, which then I'm breaking it down to dB dt, the flux, magnetic flux density. And then I'm equating these two voltages and I find that the cross section area is equal to L, this is the inductance times delta I divided by delta B that you have decided. That is, this is a constraint that you put in in order not to heat up the core too much. And N1, everything is sort of normalized to N1 because N1 is uh, actually connected to the input and this is determining the rise of delta i or delta b and in the case of a flyback the secondary is actually responsible for reducing the delta i and delta b so we have an expression for the window area the winding window area for the cross-section area and would multiply them and lo and behold we see that n1 is dropping out which is very very nice because at this stage you don't want to handle the question of n later on you can calculate it so this is independent on the number of terms because obviously you can choose a window a core with a large window area then you you have many terms but the cross-section area will be small or you can choose a, a flat magnetics for example that has a cross-section area for winding small but the cross-section area is large what is important is the product as long as you keep the product you are okay so the product is then dependent on L, delta I, this RMS contribution, delta B, J, and K. Now, for our discussion, since I'm going to compare CCM and DCM, and obviously I have to compare them on, on the same conditions, so I'm assuming a same voltage, same T on time, same delta B, same J, and K. So therefore, what I have to compare is only this part here. So I'm going to compare this term for the CCM and DCM. So first, L. Now L will determine, of course, the slope here. And we start with the state, state space equation. L is V d delta T delta I for the two cases. Now, the difference in the two cases is delta I because in the DCM we have a large change here while in the CCM we have a small change. In the case of a DCM the peak value that is this delta I is twice I ever it being a triangle while in here usually it depends on the decision of the designer. K is the proportion or the, the factor of the ripple as a function of the average. In the example I'm going to show, I'm going to assume that k is 0.4, meaning that the 
this is peak to peak so that uh, each side is 0.2 that is 20 percent of the average which is kind of very conservative because this will determine when will the flyby go into DCM while starting with CCM. So under these conditions with uh, delta i here and this delta i here, I'm getting that for the numerical example of 0.4, indeed, the CCM is larger than the DCM inductance fivefold. So AP will, on this basis, will be five times lower. However, if we go back to delta i, and we find what is the delta i here and here. Now, obviously, here it's much, much larger than here by the same factor as a matter of fact. And then we find, lo and behold, that this ratio is one over the one over five. That is, the product is one, so there is no net change, meaning that L times delta i for the two cases is the same. And that's obvious because if you look at this. Uh, equation, state rate equation, you break it down here, you see that L delta I is V delta T, and I'm assuming it's, it's same voltage, same delta T for on, so this, this product is constant. So therefore, as far as AP goes, this, there is no net change here, no net change. So what's going on here about the RMS? Well, if you look at just the waveform, clearly the RMS of the DCM is worse because it's a picky current and the RMS is a function of the I square. So therefore it is going to be larger than here. And indeed, if you do this uh, calculation, assuming again a K here, this is the RMS of the CCM. This is, uh, this is a sum of all square that I'm taking out I average, and this is K over two, assuming uh, that this is a sinusoidal waveform. And uh, the RMS of a triangular waveform is uh, one over square root of uh, three. And I end up with this expression. And for the numbers that I'm considering, it comes to be 0.86. So CCM RMS, is lower by 0.86, meaning that the size of a CCM case of the magnetic element flyback in CCM is smaller than the size of DCM. That's contrary what seems to be kind of intuitively assumed because the L, that is the inductance, is indeed much smaller, but the size is not determined just by the inductance. The current is more important because you see that you have a product of two currents. So it's like the area product is proportional sort of to the energy stored because this is L I times I, I square. So the larger the energy that you have to store, the larger will be the size. And therefore, since this product here is uh, larger in the case of the DCM, then AP is going to be large. So why use DCM? And DCM is very, very popular. Well, there are very good reasons for that. First of all, switching losses in DCM are lower. This means that it can be operated at higher frequency. And indeed, at higher frequency, you would need proportionally a smaller N. In fact, you can get to the point that indeed the size would be smaller with the same switching losses as you would have with the CCM. However, you have to watch it because as you go to a higher frequency, delta B that you would allow will be smaller normally, and therefore you have to adjust for it. But still, it is possible to get a smaller size if you work at a higher frequency that you can do because the losses are lower and I'm going to show it. Another point is the DCM is easier to control. I'm not going to go into it. And this is because it is a first order system at low frequency. And therefore uh, it's easier to control if you have a current feedback, if you're going to use, you don't have a subharmonic oscillation. You don't have to worry about 
slope compensation if you work with a duty cycle larger than 0.5. So it is easier, but that's not a major point. This is the major point, the losses. So let's have a look at the losses. In the CCM, as we turn on the transistor, we have a problem in that the diode is conducting and we turn on the transistor and now the current has to go down and then in fact we're going to see the reverse recovery of this diode here. So we're going to see a turn on quite a bit of losses. There is a current here, there is a reverse recovery. So this is going to be a fairly high loss transition. On the other hand, since the current goes to zero at the DCM, okay, the DCM, you start with zero current, so the losses that you have a turn on are only due to the capacitance, the parasitic capacitance across the transistor. So you have to sort of discharge this capacitance into the transistor, and this is a cause for losses. So therefore, the losses here at the CCM are much larger, and therefore, as you go higher to a higher frequency, this becomes a problem, while here, you can allow going to higher frequency. This is a very important aspect of the DCM. Another point is that you can improve things. For example, in the DCM, you can work in the so-called zero voltage switching, which means that you sort of look for the minimum voltage across the drain during this oscillation, which is due to the parasitic capacitance and the primary inductance, and switch it on here. Frequency will not be constant, but by this you can reduce the losses. So with DCM you can even reduce more the turn on losses by this technique of so-called zero voltage switching. You have a zero current switching inherently because there is no current in the inductor, but the losses due to the output capacitance can be reduced if you look for this value. But you can do something about the CCM losses. You can use an active clamp, so-called, which actually enables ze through zero voltage switching by reversing the current and causing the voltage to go down sort of by itself and only then you turn on the transistor. This again is covered in the one of the videos that I've linked and I'm not going to elaborate on it very much. So the conclusion is that indeed DCM has an advantage because you can operate it at higher frequency and therefore at higher frequency it'll have a fairly lower size as compared to CCM. So higher frequency DCM is certainly better. But CCM has a remedy and that would be to use the active clamp. It should be noted that as the power level goes up, DCM becomes more and more lossy because the RMS current becomes very, very large. So at high power, you wouldn't like to go DCM, you prefer CCM, and of course, preferably with an active clamp so that you get the best of the two worlds. Uh, you have a lower RMS and you combat the switching losses at turn on. So this brings you to the end of this presentation. I hope you found it of interest and perhaps it'll be useful to you in the future. Thank you very much.